An off-duty British soldier is walking down a street in South East London when he is run over, savagely stabbed and almost beheaded in broad daylight. The street is filled with people frozen in fear as they watch two extremist monsters murdering an innocent man. Who were these people? What were their motive? And why did they commit such a heinous crime? Hello lovelies, I'm True Crime Caitlin and welcome back to my channel and another True Crime Case. If you're new here, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. If you're interested in true crime, please make sure to subscribe and hit the little bell button so that you'll be notified every time I upload a brand new True Crime Case. Today marks the 10 year anniversary of the murder of Fusilia Lee Rigby and today I'm going to tell you all about his case. Please make sure to check the description box below for any trigger warnings. On the 4th of July 1987, Phil McClure and Lynn Rigby welcomed their son, Lee James McClure, into the world. The family lived in Middleton, Manchester. This was Phil, Lynn, Lee and then his two younger sisters, Chelsea and Sarah. Phil and Lynn separated a couple of years after Lee was born. However, she would go on to find love again, marrying a man named Ian. After marrying, Ian took Lynn's surname, becoming Ian Rigby, and Lee done the same, changing his surname from McClure to Rigby. Ian and Lynn would go on to have two daughters named Courtney and Amy, and this is a family picture of them all together. Throughout his childhood, Lee was always said to have been a very happy child. He was extremely loving, he was very family oriented and he always looked out for his sisters. This family unit was just a very happy one. Growing up, Lee knew exactly what he wanted to do when he got older. He dreamed of being in the army and in 2005, at age 18, he started his training to get into the army. When he got in, he was so happy. This job was exactly what he wanted to do. It was just as he imagined it would be and he had managed to fulfill one of his dream goals. He was hardworking, dedicated, he got along with everybody there and he really thrived here. During his time in the army, he also took up learning the drumming so that he could participate in the parades. During his service, Lee went out on tour to several countries out on the front line, including Germany, Cyprus and Afghanistan. After serving these tours, he returned back to the UK, more specifically to London, where he began working as an army recruiter and also working at the Tower of London. At some point during all of this, Lee managed to find love. He met a woman named Rebecca and immediately the two were completely smitten with each other and they married in 2007, only two years after meeting. And in 2011, the couple expanded their family when they had a baby. They had a little boy named Jack and Lee took to fatherhood brilliantly. He was a doting, loving father and he would often surprise Jack with gifts. He loved to give him little teddy bears that he had dressed up in army uniform and Jack was made up with these. From going out and serving on the front lines of the army, Lee knew all too well how that can affect someone physically, mentally and emotionally. He considered himself extremely lucky that he hadn't been seriously injured while serving on any of his tours and now that he's back in London he really wanted to dedicate some of his time back to his fellow soldiers to try and help out and this is how he began working alongside the charity Help for Heroes. Help for Heroes is a charity that helps provide support for British Armed Forces service personnel who have been injured or wounded in line of duty. This includes psychological support, financial support, a fellowship, a welfare support system and much more. This also extends to the service person's family. Lee was very passionate about his work here and got stuck right into it, helping them with fundraising, with raising awareness and he often wore a Help for Heroes hoodie. Lee's life just seemed on the up. He was happily married, he had a beautiful family, he was working his dream job and he was aiding in a charity that he was so passionate about. And it seemed like nothing could get in his way. However, this changed after he attended a training camp in Wales in 2012. 
While here, he met military police officer Amy West and the pair just hit it off straight away. This was very confusing for Lee, who was very happily married, who had never had eyes for any other woman up until now. Meeting Amy and spending time with her and bonding with her really kind of made Lee step back a little bit and kind of reassess his marriage. Maybe he wasn't as happy as he thought he was or even he thought he could be even happier but with Amy. After all, he and Rebecca did get married when they were really young. Lee was only 20. They had only been together for about two years when he married Rebecca as well. When he returned to London, he sat Rebecca down and told her how he was feeling, that he wasn't as happy as he thought he could be and told her that he wanted to separate. This completely blindsided Rebecca who had no idea this was coming. She was still very much deeply in love with Lee and was genuinely so, so happy with him. So this for her seemingly coming out of nowhere left her absolutely devastated. After this, Lee and Amy began a serious relationship and by February 2013, only a few months after meeting, they were engaged. They were elated, they were so, so happy and had even started to plan their wedding when Amy was deployed to Afghanistan. This was gut-wrenching for Lee because he knew what it was like over there and he even described it as being like hell. They tried to make the best of a bad situation and three and a half thousand miles between them was not going to halt the wedding planning. What Lee would do is he would go out and he would buy wedding magazines and he would then either mark or circle or highlight stuff that he liked inside the magazines and then post that to Amy so she could have a look through them as well. While she was deployed, Lee would send Amy very sweet text messages including one saying, quote, my princess is coming home. I'm never going to let you go again, ever. On the 22nd of May, she received yet another sweet text from Lee, who was very excited that she was going to be coming home soon, saying, quote, we are in the home stretch. This would be the last text that Lee would ever send Amy. The 22nd of May 2013 was just like any other regular day. Lee had been working over at the Tower of London and there had been a recruitment fair on so while here he had been talking to people, interacting with a lot of people and he then proudly wore his Help for Heroes hoodie. After his shift he made his way over to Woolwich Arsenal station. He got off the train just before 2.10pm and then made his way down John Wilson Street towards his barracks. Lee was crossing the road when a blue Vauxhall Tigra came and knocked him over going 40 miles an hour. Now Lee wasn't knocked over because he didn't look at the road before he crossed or even because the driver was distracted. Lee was already on the other side of the road when this car purposely swerved to knock him over. The car then crashed into a signpost and two men jumped out. Now rather than doing what any other normal person would do, panic or call for help or try to help Lee, these two men who were armed with knives began to stab Lee in a ferocious frenzy as he lay defenseless on the ground. They swapped weapons at one point, one of the men was now armed with a meat cleaver and he was using this to hack at Lee's neck trying to decapitate him. Now again, this is happening in the middle of the day in broad daylight on a busy London street so many people are around and are now witnessing what is happening and they froze in fear, probably not even believing what they're seeing. No one knew what to do, no one wanted to go and approach these men in fear that they would turn around and then start attacking them. The men then dragged Lee's body into the middle of the road, presumably so that people could get a better look at what they were doing, and continued to attack and mutilate him. A witness named Tina described driving along John Wilson Street when she saw what was happening. She said that these men were elated yet calm as they were hacking away at Lee. Tina jumped out of the car and shouted to the other bystanders telling them to call the police to call for help and, and this was around 20 past two so that's how fast all of this had happened not even within the space of 10 minutes. Lee had got off the train just before 10 past two and now all of this is happening Happening, not even 10 minutes later. After the men were seemingly finished attacking Lee, they didn't try to 
run away or flee which is incredibly odd usually when a perpetrator does something like this they want to escape they want to run away and evade the police but these men didn't they just sort of lingered around lee's body and even began interacting and talking with the witnesses around when they did momentarily move away from lee's body a witness had ran up to him and covered lee's top half with their jacket as a sign of respect at around this time a woman named ingrid who was on the bus on her way home arrived at the scene she peered out the window and saw lee on the floor and then saw the car that was crashed into the signpost and just presumed that there had been a car accident she saw the people surrounding lee and she just assumed that they were administrating first aid and ingrid was skilled in first aid so she could see what these people were doing and she knew that it wasn't right so she decided to step in and help coming off the bus and then approaching lee she knelt down beside him and tried to feel for a pulse she then went to remove the jacket that the earlier witness had placed down when she was stopped by one of the men who shouted to her quote don't touch the body now she looked up to this man and she saw his hands were bright red with fresh blood he was holding a meat cleaver and that's when she started to put the pieces together once she realized what had happened that it was these men that had hurt lee she didn't run away she didn't try to get to safety herself she used herself as a barrier so that these men couldn't hurt lee anymore and i just want to take a moment to appreciate the amount of bravery that ingrid had in this potentially life-threatening situation she now knew what happened and she absolutely refused to let these men hurt any further. Ingrid began to speak to the men asking them why and they were happy to talk. Witnesses began to film the men and they spoke very openly and in a lot of detail about what they had done and why they had done it, saying things such as quote, the only reason we have killed this man today is because Muslims are dying daily by British soldiers. This British soldier is one, he is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You people will never be safe. Remove your governments. They don't care about you. And, quote, Tell them to bring our troops back so that you can all live in peace. Leave our lads and you will live in peace. This is when for the first time it's revealed that Lee was murdered in some sort of political statement. When relaying these speeches, the men are very well collected and seem very unaffected by what they had just done, almost as if this was rehearsed. There are some clips out there where you can go and watch them and in one of them you can see one of the men that his hands are still very much bright red saturated in blood and he's still holding the meat cleaver that he used to try and decapitate lee the men would continue talking to bystanders and to the cameras at one point even apologizing that women had to witness what had happened saying quote i apologize that women had to witness this today but in our land, our women have to see the same thing. And when asked, they even reassured people that they weren't going to hurt anyone else, saying, quote, No, the women and children are safe. You need to keep back when the police and the soldiers get here. A woman who was there was approached by one of the men and he handed her a letter which had to my dearest children wrote on the front. She would later hand this over to police and I'm going to tell you all about the contents a little bit later. The first police arrived at the scene at around 2.30pm, however, they couldn't go and approach the men after they were told that one of the men had a gun. So they got to work blocking off the roads and trying to remove as many people as possible from the area. Armed officers shortly arrived after and at this point both of the men stood over Lay's body. When they noticed that the armed police are there, they kind of look to each other and then they both start running at the armed police and the police are shouting at them, commanding them to stop and saying that we'll shoot and the men didn't listen so armed police opened fire. A total of eight shots were fired by armed police in order to disarm the men and one of the men, the one who had the gun, actually had his thumb shot off. Once they were disarmed and on the ground, the officers who had a duty of care, no matter who these people are, had to go and start administrating first aid to them while they awaited an ambulance. Both men were taken to separate hospitals to be treated for their injuries. 
they were admitted and this is when police found out the names of Lee's killers. Their names were Michael Adebolajo, who was 29 years old, and Michael Adebowale, who was 22 years old. Because both of these men share the same first name, I am going to just refer to them by their surname throughout the rest of the video. And as I always do, I'm just going to give you all a little bit of background on both of these men. Michael Adebolajo, originally from Romford, was brought up by his Nigerian immigrant parents as a very devoted Christian. He had a pretty regular upbringing, he'd done quite well in school and would go on to go to Greenwich University where he would study sociology. It was while he was here in university that he got mixed with the wrong crowd and made some very bad friends. From these friends, he ended up converting religion from Christianity over to Islam, which was a pretty big step. He had been a devoted Christian man all of his life thus far and was brought up by his parents to be a quote, good Christian man. He ended up dropping out of university and began attending these extremist groups which had links to the outlawed Islamist group al Mahajirun. This extremist group would be responsible for various terror attacks in the upcoming years, including the 2017 London Bridge attack which saw men in vans just running over, driving into as many people as possible, trying to kill as many people as they could. They were also responsible to a more recent terror attack, which was the 2019 London Bridge attack, which saw people from this group armed with knives, just walking around and attacking and stabbing as many people as they could, trying to kill. Both of these attacks happened after Adebolajo's time with them, but I just wanted to tell you about them, just so you get a bit of an idea on how dangerous and how lethal this group is these people can be. At these groups slash meetings they would preach a very twisted and distorted version of Islam and it would really rile up and enhance the extremist feelings that he was developing. He would become involved in many of their protests and was once arrested at a protest outside of the Old Bailey. In autumn 2010, Adebolajo attempted to get into Somalia so that he could train with Al-Shabaab who were linked with Al-Qaeda, these terror groups. In order to get to Somalia, he had to travel through Kenya and that's as far as he made it. He and several others who were attempting the same thing were stopped at the border, arrested by Kenyan police and then deported back to the UK. This is a picture of some of them. Adebolajo is in the middle wearing the dark t-shirt. When he arrived back in the UK, he cut no more than a slap on the wrist for trying to join a terror group and was just let go. Him being sent back to the UK from Somalia was a deep embarrassment for Adebolajo and it was incredibly frustrating. It's believed that this contributed to why he would go on to later murder Lee Rigby. Adebolajo felt that now he had no other choice but to act out and do something in the UK in order to get his message out. Like other people had done to him many years prior, Adebolajo began to go out and look for other young men to recruit into these terror groups and that's how he met Adebowale. Over the next upcoming years, Adebolajo would get married and he would father six children, his youngest child being born only four days before Lee Rigby's murder. Adebowale, similar to Adebolajo, was raised by his Nigerian immigrant parents as devoted Christians. He was born and raised in Greenwich where he lived quite a comfortable life. His parents were both very well respected hard workers. His mom was a probation officer and then his dad worked for the Nigerian High Commission. When he was around 16 years old, Adebowale witnessed one of his friends getting brutally murdered in front of him and this very much had lasting effects on him. It changed his behaviour and he started to rebel which resulted in him spending one year in a juvenile prison for drug offences. He seemed to get his life back on track however and he also attended Greenwich University and this is where he met Adebolajo. Adebowale sort of mirrored Adebolajo after this, converting from Christianity over to Islam and joining these extremists 
extremist terror groups. At these extremist groups, an extremely twisted, manipulated and distorted version of Islam is preached, a version that is so far from what Islam actually is. They promote violence, extremism and just pure hatred. Now, I don't know a lot about religion, kind of any religion really, but when I was researching this, I did look into Islam and what its core beliefs are and what Muslims practice, and this is briefly what I found. There is something called the five pillars of Islam, which are the main things that they follow and practice, including number one, the profession of faith, which is the belief that there is no God but God and that Muhammad is the messenger. Two, prayer. Three, almsgiving, which is donating to charity or to their community. Number four, which is fasting, which is when they participate in Ramadan. And then five is pilgrimage. So these people within the extremist groups are taking verses from the Quran completely out of context and using this to justify their horrific acts and essentially brainwash their followers. What these extremist groups and these extremist people do does not reflect Islam and they do not share the same beliefs as the Muslim community. They use religion that they've took out of context Context and that they very heavily distorted as an excuse to do whatever they want. While both the men are still in the hospital, police begin to try and figure out what had happened. They had their killers and now they just needed to know everything else. The letter that I spoke about earlier, that one of the men, which was Adabalajo, handed to a woman on the scene, it had to my beloved children wrote on the front. That was written by Adabalajo and when it was read, it was sort of read like a suicide note. It consisted of him speaking to other extremists, urging them to commit more horrific acts and to seek revenge and to die for the cause just as he did. But Adabalajo didn't die and this is when police sort of realised what he was trying to do. And this in turn also answered one of the questions that they had which was why didn't the men flee after they murdered Lee? Now they realise that Adabalajo and Adabawale openly spoke to the witnesses and to the cameras and allowed themselves to be recorded because they wanted to get this political message out there. But the reason that they stayed at the scene and didn't flee was because they were expecting and hoping that these armed officers were going to shoot them and kill them, thus making them martyrs. But that didn't happen. The armed officers didn't shoot to kill, they shot them to disarm them. Investigators took statements from witnesses who were there and they also collected any and all pictures and videos that had taken and they also retrieved CCTV footage from the many shops that were along John Wilson Street. From all of this, they were able to create a timeline and actually trace these two men right back to the day before. So on the 21st of May, Adabalajo were seen on CCTV in an Argos in Lewisham buying knives. These would be the knives that would be used to murder Lee the next day. The next morning on the day of the murder, the men met up at Greenwich House Flats between half eight and nine o'clock. From here, they went and put some petrol in the car and then began just sort of driving around the Woolwich Barracks area, just scoping out a victim, waiting to spot a soldier that they could kill. It was said that from when the men spotted Lee, it took them mere seconds to decide that he was the one that they were going to kill. There was no reluctance, there was no second guessing, nothing like that. Adabalajo and Adabawale saw Lee, a proud soldier, a family man, a good man, wearing a help for heroes hoodie and decided to run him down. And it took them only two minutes to spot him, run him over and then kill him. Investigators did think that maybe this could have been the start of a much bigger operation so they searched several houses and they made several other arrests but eventually those charges were dropped and it was deemed that Adabalajo and Adabawale were solely responsible for Lee's murder. Investigators on this case just couldn't shake the similarities between this murder and an al Mahajarun attack. Attacks from this group are almost always harder to predict because they're so quick and lethal. Like Adabalajo and Adabawale had only bought the knives that they would use to kill Lee the day before, but because this is such a common item, how were they able to distinguish that these knives were bought for the wrong reasons? The only sort of difference between this and an al Mahajarun attack 
attack was that the al Mahajarun's attacks want to cause mass destruction. They want to kill as many people as possible. But with these two had set out with an agenda, they wanted to go out and kill a soldier. And after they had done that, they seemed quite satisfied. As I mentioned earlier, it took up to 15 minutes for armed police to arrive. So within that time, these two men, if they had wanted to, could have harmed or killed so many more people, but they just didn't. Adebowale was discharged from hospital first on the 28th of May, followed by Adebalaji, who was discharged three days later. They were both sent to different police stations and were both charged with Lee Rigby's murder. Adebowale was also charged for possession of a firearm. Throughout their interrogations, the officers were actually very surprised at how seemingly truthful the men were being. They hadn't seen each other since their arrests. They had been in different hospitals, so they didn't have any chance to kind of come up with a story. And from what I could find, everything that the pair were telling the officers seemed to match up quite well. Adebalajo was asked why it was Lee that they had decided to kill and he responded saying quote, it just so happened that he was the soldier that was spotted first. It was almost as if Allah had chosen him. When I thought about obeying Allah in the past, I thought maybe it is possible to kill a man by driving into him. When he crossed the road in front of me, it was almost as if I was not in control of myself. I accelerated, I hit him, and I think I crashed into a signpost. We wish to fulfill our promise to Allah. We do not wish to give him much pain. I could see he was still alive. We exited the vehicle and I'm not sure how I struck the first blow. When describing the barbaric way in which he killed Lee, Adbalajo was very nonchalant and he had no feelings of remorse and no feelings at all really. He described trying to decapitate Lee saying quote, the most humane way to kill any creature is to cut the jugular. He may be my enemy but he is a man so I struck at the neck and attempted to remove the head. They admitted that Lee had done nothing wrong for them to target him for the murder. He did nothing to trigger them. He did nothing to provoke them. He was just minding his own business, crossing the road, getting on with his day, and he was targeted and killed just because he was a soldier. Adebalajo and Adebowale in both of their interviews expressed that they too were soldiers, that they were soldiers of Allah and they had done this murder to please him but to them it wasn't really a murder because they're soldiers and Lee's a soldier and they're in war and that's what happens in war so this wasn't a murder to them which is just nonsense. After Lee's murder, the Ministry of Defence asked all soldiers and servicemen and women to not wear their uniforms out in public, to not use their army backpacks out in public and to kind of not wear anything that shows their support to soldiers in public because although they did determine that Lee's murder was purely because of these two men's fault, they were still worried that this could have been part of a bigger operation and they really wanted to keep their servicemen and women safe. Proceedings for their trial began in November 2013 at the Old Bailey and shockingly both of these men pled not guilty to Lee's murder and they reiterated what I just told you all that it wasn't murder because they were both soldiers fighting in a war. Outside the courthouse people were stood with signs calling for the death penalty to come back. There were flags which had Lee's face printed on and then there were also very racist flags as well which I'm not going to show. After a three week trial and around 90 minutes of deliberation a jury found both Michael Adbalajo and Michael Adebowale guilty of the murder of Lee Rigby. When their verdict was read out they were quite stoic and calm, didn't really give a reaction or say anything but this didn't carry over to their sentencing. In February 2014 at their sentencing the judge spoke directly to both of the men and told them that they were not soldiers of Allah and that they had completely disgraced and betrayed Islam and this infuriated them. They both began to scream and shout at the judge and it took nine or ten security guards 
guards to pull them out of the courtroom so their sentencing ended up going on without their presence. Adebolajo was sentenced to a whole life order meaning that he will die behind bars and he will never get the opportunity to be released. Adebowale was given a 45 year sentence meaning that he will be able to apply for release when he is in his late 70s and early 80s. They have both since tried to appeal these sentences but were thankfully unsuccessful. In 2019, Adebowale actually wrote a letter to the Rigby family where inside he apologised for Lee's murder and recognised that what he'd done was disgusting and harrowing and inhumane. Lynn, who again is Lee's mum, had come out and said that she just didn't care for the letter, she doesn't want to know about him and she will never forgive him and I don't blame her for that. In 2020, during the Black Lives Matter protests, people were using Lee, his name and his picture for arguments against Black Lives Matter and this was devastating for the Rigby family who posted this message stating that these posts were heartbreaking, distressing and the complete opposite for what Lee stood for. The days and weeks following Lee's murder, Islamophobia was reported to have gone up eight times. Mosques were being targeted for vandalism, there was an instance when two men had broken into a mosque and completely trashed it and vandalised every single Quran in there. There was another incident when during prayer people had broken into a mosque armed with knives and threatened everyone inside. Mosques were being petrol bombed and an Islamic boarding school was set on fire and 128 kids had to be evacuated. Kids who probably had no idea why they were being targeted. In the streets Muslim women were being violated having their hijabs ripped off their head which is just absolutely disgusting. Muslim women wear hijabs to protect their modesty and by someone going and pulling it off their head that is one of the most disgusting things that you can do and it is so disrespectful it is horrible and this is just an example of the hundreds of things that were reported never mind the many other incidents that weren't. The whole Muslim community in the UK were greatly suffering because of the actions of these two evil extremists that had nothing to do with any of the other Muslim community and it was only being fuelled by the press. When reporting about Lee's murder the press was sort of reporting it as look at what Adbalajo and Adbawale had done in the name of Islam which couldn't be further from the truth. This was done in their name of their own evil, sick and twisted extremist beliefs and in the name of al Mahajirum. and the press tie in the whole Muslim community with these two evil extremist people is disgusting and it's just outright an insult. They don't share the same beliefs and they couldn't have been more opposite. And that is today's case. A truly heartbreaking case about the murder of Lee Rigby who was a proud soldier, who was a good man and who was murdered because of these two extremist monsters. Ten years ago a day, Lee Rigby was senselessly murdered but his name, what he stood for and what he believed in will never be forgotten. I have left some links in the description box below if you would like to donate either to the Lee Rigby Foundation or to Help for Heroes in memory of Lee. Thank you all so much for sitting and listening with me today. If you're interested in listening to some more true crime cases from me, I have plenty on my channel that you can go ahead and watch right now. Please don't forget to subscribe and to click the little bell button so that you'll be notified every time I upload a true crime case and make sure to give this video a thumbs up as well. Thank you all again so much for sitting and listening with me today. I appreciate each and every single one of you so so much and I will see you all on my next one.